Okay, we'll get rolling here and get some housekeeping uh, items out of the way. Uh, good evening. For anyone who does not know me, I'm Dr. Bob LaPerriere, often known just as Dr. Bob, and welcome to our first virtual Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society Museum of History program. I curate the museum at the Medical Society and have done that for about 18 years now. As many of you are aware, we are uh, try to schedule four programs yearly and have done that for almost two decades. As we are not able to gather physically, we're switching to Zoom so we can continue to offer these programs. Also, keep your eyes on our website as we will be adding new items, including a collection of black and white photographs from about 1900 from the glass slide collection of Dr. Junius Harris. And also, I am working on a virtual tour of the physicians at the city cemetery. Though Zoom is less personable, it does make it more convenient for many people to attend and also has many other hidden environmental benefits. If you have topics related to medical history you would like to hear about, please contact me. You can either email uh, info at ssvms.org or email me directly at xtbob, xtbob at surewest.net. Now you are able to ask questions during the presentation simply by typing them in in the question and answer or chat bar at the bottom of your screen and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. I wish to thank Sam Mello, Medical Society staff, for setting up all the details for tonight's program and uh, keeping us on, online and helping us to correct things we're not doing right because Zoom is new for most of us. Now, one last thing before I introduce our speaker. As many of you know, the Museum of Medical History is a completely volunteer-run operation. Due to COVID-19 and the closure of the museum, we have been looking at new ways to bring these collections to the public. Please consider making tax-deductible donations to the museum to help us continue our efforts of education and particularly increasing what's available online virtually and also for the preservation of our medical history. You can do so by visiting ssvms.org museum. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Scott Kellerman. Dr. Kellerman received his medical degree from Tulane University uh, School of Medicine and a master's degree in public health and tropical medicine from Tulane University School of Public Health. He was an intern at the USC LA Hospital uh, and a family practice resident at UCLA. After practicing medicine in Nepal, for two and a half years. He was a family physician in Nevada County for two decades. In 2001, he and his wife, Carol, relocated to the uh, Buindi Impenetrable, Impenetrable Forest of Uganda to work with the Batma Pygmies. Dr. Kellerman has written chapters for medical textbooks and has published multiple articles in medical journals regarding diseases of the tropics. He's been honored with the Rotary Service Above, Sur Above Self Award, New York University's Excellence in Public Health Award, American Medical Association's Excellent in Medicine, Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine's Outstanding Alumni, and the Wisdom and Action's Unsung Hero of Compassion Award presented by the Dalai Lama. In 2017, 2018, he was a Fulbright scholar teaching tropical medicine in Africa. Currently, Dr. Kellerman is an adjunct professor at the University of San Francisco, an assistant professor, clinical, pres clinical professor of medicine at North State University College of Medicine. He's married with two sons and five grandchildren. His grandchildren particularly enjoy dancing with the Batwa and lodging in the jungle guest house where they have close encounters with the mountain gorillas and other creatures of the forest. I'd like to welcome Dr. Scott Kellerman and uh, give our appreciation for his joining us tonight for his presentation. Dr. Kellerman. Thanks, Dr. Bob. 
And I really want to thank Sam. Uh, she's the IT guru, so thanks a lot. And George, you out there, George Meyer. Um, George and I go way back. Um, I dated his, um, his sister when I was in high school. I took her to the prom. So if you're out there, give my best to your wife, Lynn. Uh, it's really an honor to speak to this August Medical Society. We work with the Batua Pygmies of the Buindi Impenetrable Forest. Uh, if you see the first slide, that not everybody in that photo is, is uh, Batua Pygmy. There's a fellow in the back named Steve Gonzalez, who's actually a local guy. And he came over with a two-week rotary trip and ended up staying five years. So if you come over to Africa, watch out for those short-term trips. If you come, it's a little difficult right now with the COVID shutdown, but if you come, uh, you got to bring your dancing shoes. Uh, we dance every day. We begin our medical staff uh, meetings, uh, medical staff uh, gatherings in the morning with singing, dancing, and drumming. All the departments talk about what um, is on their schedule for the day so we can work as a team. Not only is it team building, it helps com compress the hierarchy. So I'd encourage you to bring uh, drums and dancing to your um, local hospital. Here's a little video about how things got started and, and the problems that the Batwa had um, with the Buindi and Penisable Forest. <laughs> Only a fraction of a degree from the equator, in the center of Africa, is the country of Uganda. Home to some of the most welcoming people and diverse landscapes the world has to offer. Winston Churchill called it the Pearl of Africa. In the southwest corner of the country is a piece of forest that managed to survive the last ice age. This area became a World Heritage Site in the early 90s to protect the magnificent but greatly endangered mountain gorilla. Unfortunately, we forgot about a marginalized, unloved, and understudied group of Aboriginal people that are relatives to us all. Only a few years ago, the Batwa Pygmies were abruptly evicted from their homeland, left with nothing. So it's a short video clip. Um, where we live in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is in southwestern Uganda. It's got the greatest biodiversity on the face of the planet. It's my friend Andy Wright uh, up in the tree, and his question is, I wonder if those lions bite? Um, this is the uh, magic of Photoshop. He's in a tree, and they're in a tree, but thankfully not the same tree. We had a medical student from UCSF, very intelligent, but very not very smart. I'm sure you know people like that. And we're at the Ashasha River, which is a river that divides uh, Uganda and the Congo. And he said, I wonder if I can get that bull hippo to charge. And the answer was yes. And But the problem is that hippos kill more people in sub-Saharan Africa than all the other animals combined. Pygmies are very diminutive, uh, only four and a half feet in height and produce little bitty babies. We went over in the year 2000, my wife and I, we did a medical survey of the Batwa, and what we found was pretty overwhelming. 38% of the Batwa were dying before the age of five compared to the national average under age five mortality of 18%, which compares very unfavorably with the US rate of 0.8%. And the reason is just abject poverty. Life expectancy, everything accounted for was stage 28 and the income, annual income per family was $25. If you want to know why kids aren't educated, they don't have access to health care, where there's land insecurity and food insecurity, the bottom line is just abject poverty. So if you're going to go and deal with these issues, you have to deal with poverty. Uh, when my wife and I first went over there, um, it was a bit of a wrestle because I'm a doc, there was no health care delivery, my wife's a teacher, it wasn't much in the way of education. So we spent the first couple of years living in a tent, uh, just traveling around, learning the language, the customs and the traditions. It was quite a change from before I left because you know, I was chief of staff at Sierra Nevada Hospital and some friends of mine had bought an old hospital and trying to run that thing. And I was involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters and involved with church activities. My wife was getting a degree in San Francisco. We're like shifts passing in the night. And then the upshot was when we kind of unloaded everything and started living in a tent together, you know, we found new love, uh, certainly romantic love. It was great. So I'd encourage any of you out there that are listening to 
know, this this webinar to um, I mean, if you're wrestling with interpersonal stuff, I'd forego all that counseling. Just um, instead of that, just sell everything you got and live in a tent in the developing world. It, it's a sure path to marital bliss. Um, when I first arrived, I was the only doc for a population of about a quarter million patients to be carried in the semi. We'd find them just lying alongside the road, hoping somebody would come and pick them up. And our major medical adventures were mobile medical clinics. There are no hospitals in the area. We'd just drive to the end of the road and then hike out to underneath a big tree by the forest. And the drums would go off announcing our arrival and people start drifting in. We'd see anywhere from 200, 300, sometimes 500 people a day. Uh, our ICU was under the shade of the tree. Sometimes we'd hang IVs in the branches of trees, securing them with vines. And all these IVs are dripping life-saving quinine into the veins of kids who are suffering from cerebral malaria, which is universally fatal if untreated. Where do you go? Uh, this is a typical conveyance in sub-Saharan Africa, and regardless of what it looks like, it's not safe. So we broke ground in 2003 for an outpatient unit, and then um, at the lower slide, we put up a maternity unit, and reason for the maternity unit was the maternal death rate for our area in southwestern Ghana was 880 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. If you do the math, for every 113 births, a mother would die in pregnancy. It was the highest maternal mortality I could find in the peer-reviewed literature. So our focus then, and it continues to be now, is maternal and child health. Now we have a 135 bed hospital, which has been ranked um, one of the highest ranked hospitals in East Africa for several years. It's soon to expand. We're in a construction phase right now to expand to 180 beds. This is our pediatric ward. It's open and area, fits within the local tradition. Uh, every day at four o'clock, the drums come out and we have singing and dancing. And I'm always amazed to see a kid that is kind of semi-comatose, the drums will start and the kid will kind of sit up in bed and start clapping to the music. It's very therapeutic. So again, I would bring um, drumming and dancing to all your hospitals in the Sacramento Sierra area. Even though we're at the end of the road, we treat some of the sickest of the sick. And we have consultants that come from all over. We live next to only two kilometers from the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a conflict zone. And as a result, we do refugee medicine periodically. These were 25,000 refugees who came across. Went over to evaluate it, set up a little medical clinic, and we noticed uh, intractable um, rice water stools, you know, harbinger of, um, of cholera. So we were also working in a hydrology project with some Rotarians. They came over, identified a clean water site source, and were able to cordon off the dirty water and, and, and kind of prevented the, the cholera epidemic from continuing. This is our maternity unit. And one of the things that the women requested was a waiting mother's hostel. The reason is they needed a place to stay when before they went into labor because we have no paved roads, roads in the whole district uh, and there's no public transportation. So if a woman's had a previous cesarean section or a complication from the current um, uh, pregnancy and she goes into labor in her village and she starts walking, it's a one to two day walk to our institution and, and neither she nor the baby will do well. So we have a 40 bed waiting mother's hostel for a total charge of $1.25, regardless of how long you stay. You can stay a few days, a few weeks. Some people even stay a few months. We have a communal laundry and, and kitchen. They got education while they're um, waiting, um, about antenatal care, how to take care of the kids and, and family planning. And right next door, they have access to cesarean sections and um, and normal vaginal deliveries. Um, if you come with an MD behind your name, you're expected to do surgery. That's actually me, I'm a family doc, but we do a, a lot of cesarean sections. That section rate is actually about 30% because you, we're a referral hospital. The result is our delivery rate has gone up rather asymptotically. We used to deliver about 20 kids a month. Now we're over 200 a month and our maternal mortality has dropped by over 90%. But as you know, a hospital really doesn't affect the health of the community. You deal with the sickest of the sick, just walk the wards or visit in the ICU. They're elderly. Um, but how do you get ahead of the curve? 
we had a, a friend of mine from a med school named Ken came over with his, his daughter, uh, Kristen. She was a new medical student at Tulane. And they came for a couple of months. And after he'd been there about a month, <coughs> excuse me, over dinner, he said, how do you work with the Abafumu? Now, Abafumu are traditional healers, um, uh, medicine men. Some people call them witch doctors. And I said, well, I, it's very hard to work with them but because they have unconscionable practices, um, practices where they – We'll make a cut in the skin and put herbs in it. So we'll see kids come in with festering wounds. They will take hot implements and burn over, this, over the area where they think the disease is, kind of to try to pull out the evil, evil humors. So we see kids with second and third degree burns. And the most problematic is kids between the age of six months and nine months when the maternal antibodies are waning, same time the lower uh, canine teeth start erupting. And they'll associate the two, the uh, frequent infections and lower canines. And they will extract these lower canine teeth, sometimes using a sharpened um, bicycle spoke. It's called infant oral mutilation. So I said, and this is what we see, about 12 to 15% of the kids in our area have had this infant oral mutilation. I told my friend, Ken, you know, ah, I can't work with these people. How would you? Their practices are unconscionable. He said, well, in my short time here, my studies have indicated that 90% of your patients have seen the Abafumu traditional healer before they come to your hospital. You tell me you can't work with them. I'll tell them you can't work without them. So we agreed to have a meeting. And about 40 of them showed up in our living room one day, all dressed in their traditional garb. This is one dressed as uh, Nabinje, one of the um, small gods. Uh, and we went around the room introducing ourselves and all the Abafumu had subspecialties, lightning strikes and maternal and child health or, or potency issues and malaria. And then uh, when I had a chance to speak, I said, do you have any um, uh, problems working with me? And one of the head Abafumu stood up and he said, yeah, we think you're going to be judgmental. Well, I thought for a second and I said, uh, you're right. You got me, but I'm going to put judgment on the table. If you find me being judgmental, you, you call me on it. And then an Abafumu stood up. Another one stood up and he said, what do you think about our practices of Kushara the cutting or Omaruro the burning or Abino pulling the teeth? What do you think about our practices? You know, I was like a deer in the headlight. How do you respond? You know, if I said they were unconscionable, the meeting's over. And then while I was standing there trying to figure out a response, this elderly lady stood up in the corner of the room and the room got this death-like hush to it. And I felt the hair in the back of my neck standing on end and, and the fellow next to me said, that's Batuza. Like, Whoa, you're kidding me. I'd heard about Batuza by reputation. She was the most powerful Abafumu in the valley with a curse you would die. And so uh, Batuza worked her way over to this one fella and put her hand on his shoulder and put him in a seat. And when she had all our attention, she said, we're going to talk about what we have in common, not our differences. Can you imagine a world where we talk about commonalities rather than differences? What would it look like? So we started meeting every two weeks, and now we meet every month. And now we have 550 called Village Health Team members. The backbone of them is these Abafumu traditional healers. There are eyes, ears, and feet on the ground. They're the ones organizing immunization campaigns, making sure people are taking antiretrovirals or TB medicines, making sure maternal health women come in if they need to be delivered. They're the backbone of our hospital. The first project we took on was malaria. Malaria is a devastating illness in sub-Saharan Africa. 600,000 kids die in sub-Saharan Africa every year from, cerebral, from malaria, usually kids under the age of five. Kind of on, the, on the left uh, slide is getting a transfusion. Now, we frequently see kids with malaria with uh, hemoglobins of uh, two or less. And the kid on the right, cerebral malaria, and you can see the divergent gaze. Sadly, this child only lived about half an hour after I took the photo. So we had gone out and tried to distribute bed nets, but the people wouldn't accept them. So we went back and met with the Abafumus, traditional healers, and we said, people won't take the bed nets. And they say, why? And we said, because they believe malaria is caused by Stan, a demon. And they said, well, yeah, it's caused by Stan. I said, how do you figure that? Well, kids under age five, 
malaria goes to the brain, cerebral malaria, they get seizures, that's demon possession. So we said, ah, oh, we gotta, let's work with us. So they agreed to. So we took him down to the hospital and we showed him what the life, showed him what the parasite looked like under the microscope and then showed him the life cycle of the Anopheles mosquito and we got buy-in um, from these abafumu. And, and then we said, okay, let's go give away these nets. And they said, you can't give them away, you have to sell them. He said, sell them, that's unconscionable. He said, you know, this is a very poor area, ultra poor and these mosquito nets prevent death in kids under age five. And they said, unless you sell them, they will not appreciate them. So we agreed, all right, we'll trust you on that. So we just a barter thing, well, a bow or an arrow, a basket. We started distributing a thousand beds a month, bed nets a month mainly. Our target population was kids under age five and all pregnant women. And after we had distributed about 30,000 bed nets, we noticed the malaria rates start plummeting. We looked at our statistics, 40% of our outpatients used to be due to malaria, now it's 2.5%. A few years ago, we were losing one to two kids every week from malaria. And now we go uh, six to nine months without a child dying of malaria. It's a real miracle. The other thing they helped us with is mental illness. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they don't know what, how to deal with psychosis. And so they frequently chain people up, just tie them up. They don't know how to deal with it. So the Abafumu identify these people. And then we send out, um, we go out and assess them and we send out long acting antipsychotics. We'll use haloperidol and we give them an injection. And then about a week later, we send out our village health team members with a hacksaw and they unshackle these people with mental illness, allowing them to live a, a reasonable mental life, um, a reasonably normal life after all these years. All right, quiz time. Um, like I say, I usually teach, I can't see you all, but um, if you can give a little feedback, this disease jumped the Darwinian divide uh, sometime in the 1930s, they're not sure when. First blood sample was found in Kinshasa in 1959. Um, people think it was either from blood transmission or from eating raw chimp brains because bushmeat is highly prized in, in, uh, in the Congo. So if you come over, um, you know, don't order um, uh, bush meat or raw chimp brains. And the answer is HIV. World's burden of HIV is in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's probably 28 million, you know, that numbers, you know, the reporting system in Sub-Saharan Africa is poor. So if you work in our clinic, um, if somebody's uh, lost weight, just have them open their mouth. Um, oral thrush is not an AIDS defining illness. Esophageal thrush is, but if you see that, you know that something bad's going on. And of course, you know, Kaposi's sarcoma, uh, we see that it, that is an AIDS defining illness. One thing we've tried to deal with is maternal to child transmission of HIV. This mother's wasted, so are the child, both have AIDS. And you know the numbers of, um, of, of transmission we have. Um, we have a very um, mature uh, counseling service when a woman does have HIV and is pregnant. But the numbers are if a, if a mother is HIV positive and is untreated, depending on a viral load, anywhere between 15 to 45% of her offspring will be HIV positive. And if this child is not diagnosed, 50% of those HIV kids will be dead before the age of two. If you give antiretroviral drugs, the latter part of the pregnancy, treat the kid first year of pregnancy during the breastfeeding stage, the mother continues antiretrovirals, you can reduce that from 15 to 45%. WHO says less than 2%, we're less than 1%. And we went for two years without one child being born with HIV. So the take home message is no child need to have HIV. Here's an HIV positive mom who's really happy because her child is negative. This is our HIV unit uh, donated by Elton John. Appreciate his music a whole lot more, you know, Saturday night and all that. Anyway, the interesting thing about his HIV, the HIV unit is there's no seating outside, it's all inside because HIV still carries the stigma attached to it. Patients don't want to be identified. So they come in and they get teaching. Uh, we have expert patients that go out into the community uh, and they talk about how to live a healthy life uh, with HIV. They bring in HIV test people for testing. We test about a thousand people per month and have 5,000 people under therapy. Also in this unit, they have, um, uh, there's a pharmacy where they get their antiretrovirals. There's a lab where we draw CD4 counts and, and viral loads. 
This is a fellow named Luther Ward. Actually, I went to school with his dad named Dick Ward, who's a transplant surgeon at UC Davis. And as you know, we can cure sometimes, treat often, but we always can comfort. And he's comforting this child, uh, the mainly the mother, because this child has neonatal tetanus from severing the umbilical cord with a forearm implement. But um, sadly, the child did not survive. Both he, uh, Luther's been over, his, his brother Matt and his father Dick has been to, uh, to our hospital in the past. You know the statistics here, one third of the world's population is affected with TB. You see that big cavitary lesion in the left upper lobe. This is Miller ATB named from millet seeds. Active case infects 10 to 15 people a year, usually close contacts. Um, and the problem is if they have a resistant strain of TB, that's what they'll pass on. They won't pass on uh, the wild bacteria. Um, working with the Abafumu, our traditional healers, uh, we were had about 56% uh, of our patients would complete eight months of, um, of the treatment regime for TB. Uh, that was just a tick above the national average of 53%. Now we have 97% uh, compliance with eight months of therapy and it's the highest compliance rate in East Africa working with these Abafumu. All right, another quiz time here. Uh, compression of the anterior vertebral bodies produces profound kyphosis and named after POTS. This is POTS disease. It's another one. Um, we see most of this is mycobacterium caused by tuberculosis. Mycobacterium, but mainly we see Mycobacterium bovis from drinking unpasteurized cow's milk. They cause the TB pharyngitis, TB lymphadenitis, and then this draining uh, sinus, which is called scrofula. All right, Dr. Bob, um, this is uh, was diagnosed by my friend and colleague Haynes Ely, um, and this actually is lupus vulgaris, uh, cutaneous tu tuberculosis. So. Really, the universal masquerader is not syphilis. It's it's TB. It can present in any form. All right, you're on again, Dr. Bob. This is another. Um, these skin lesions are anesthetic. Big tip off, um, and it can go on to cause more serious problems. The reservoir is a nine-banded armadillo. Um, it's actually well treated these days. You don't see it so much anymore. Um, you can treat it with um, dapsone or rifampin and for multibacillary leprosy, uh, you can give uh, clofazamine, a nine month uh, treatment regime and, and a very high cure rate. Zoonotic infections, COVID-19 forefront. Um, I mean, obviously you know where it came from, from Wuhan, but we see zoonotic. I mean, um, UC Davis had a PREDICT study Sadly, it was defunded a few years ago, and it was supposed to predict the next pandemic. And uh, they were studying a lot of the primates in our area because zoonotic infections a lot come from uh, primates. And and this is the the slide of the mountain gorilla. There is I opened my front door one morning, and that was the mountain gorilla right outside the front door. And that shouldn't happen. I shouldn't get that close to a mountain gorilla. And the reason zoonotic infections are so problematic is not only do they, you know, close contact from encroachment of ecosystem, ease of international travel, and usually replicates in very dense populations like this disease. I'm sure you're aware of this one. Um, in 1947, they put out uh, some cages with uh, rhesus macaw monkeys in them uh, to study yellow fever. And they, they, they came down with a, a novel virus, uh, which was named after the forest where the, um, the monkeys were placed, the Zika forest outside of Entebbe, Uganda. Now, the strange thing is, although it was diagnosed first in Uganda, uh, there's no higher prevalence of microcephaly in Uganda. So apparently the virus, as it spread, went down to French Polynesia and then over to a very population dense area of Brazil where replicating become, became more teratogenic. Another disease that was recently declared um, over um, in, in Eastern uh, Congo is this one named after the Ebola River in, in Eastern Congo. Uh, it's pretty obvious you know, problem. It's, um, you know, presentations are obvious hemorrhagic fever. Uh, we had, um, 
there were 3,300 people diagnosed with Ebola and the death rate was um, 2,200 of them died. About two thirds of the people that had Ebola died from their disease. But now it's, it's there's a gene-based vaccine. They did reading vaccination and contact tracing and did a very good job. Ebola, by the way, is transmitted from secretions. And the real problem with Ebola was that uh, the families would bathe the dead after after they died, they would wash the dead, and uh, that was bad. I mean, obviously, uh, people, family members were most likely to get infected. This is a statue at the World Health Organization headquarters. And look at the, the face on that kid, just the look of determination. And um, this is the life that he's been given. He is sighted, and the man behind him is blind. And so until that fellow behind him dies or becomes incapacitated, that's, he doesn't go to school. You can see how he's dressed. He doesn't engage. All he does is lead that man around. This disease is um, mainly in northern Uganda near the Sudanese border. Uh, it's transmitted by a black fly uh, called Simulium damnosum, pretty interesting name. It causes leopard legs early on. Later on, it, you get these nodules, and if you open up the, um, the nodule, you see the macrofilaria, and the diagnosis is Onchocerca, river blindness. It's well treated by a drug called ivermectin. Uh, Mectan is a brand name donated free of charge by Merck. Um, so you know, a uh, round of applause for Merck. They've done a great job with that. Also, um, it's dependent upon a bacteria called Wolbachia. So if you give uh, ivermectin uh, along with doxycycline, it tends to be a little more effective. It needs to be treated for uh, 10 years, annually treated for 10 years. This is a picture in northern Uganda near the Sudanese border, and this is uh, the adults being led around. This is a fascinating disease. Another um, um, quiz time for you is uh, this is one of the first parasitic diseases ever to be eradicated from the planet, thanks to the Carter Foundation. Uh, life cycle is you walk into a well called a step well to gather water. Female worm kind of merges through a little blister, spreads larva out in the water. It's ingested by a locopia pod called a cyclops. Another victim comes along, takes a drink of the water. The uh, copiapod dissolves in the intestinal tract. The male and female worm migrate into the peritoneal cavity where they mate. Then the female worm migrates down to the lower extremity and waits for you to go into the water and the life cycle is completed. The method of, method of extraction is uh, to take a stick and slowly wind the worm out on the stick over the course of several hours, careful not to break the worm, which some medical historians, Dr. Bob, I already have this in the museum, um, it considers this the origin of the um, uh, staff of Escalapius, the caduceus. Um, and if you look at the Old Testament uh, in Numbers 21, there's um, Moses, the fiery serpents. They, they think that might have been the Dracunculus mediensis or the, the guinea worm. All right, how do you afford all this stuff, medical care in a resource poor setting? Because we have... Um, what we think is very high quality healthcare delivery system, but we're in a resource poor area. And we thought we'd roll out health insurance. The real problem is in the indigenous language, they don't have a future or past tense. So how do you sell, sell it's hard to sell health insurance in America, uh, much less to a, a people group that don't have a future tense. So we looked at indigenous models and there was a group called Pataka groups who were started in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. The most expensive thing you can do in your life is die because funerals are very, very expensive. Hundreds of people come, you sing all night, uh, you have to offer food to them and libations and the burials last for sometimes five to seven days. I've gone to a lot of burials. So they started something called Bataka Twiziche, natives would bury ourselves. And so for a small amount of money paid at the beginning of the year, if you die, your burial's covered. So we went to the Bataka leaders, the ones that collect the money, they do it free of charge. We went and talked to them and they said, would you be dealing with health insurance rather than death insurance? And we got buy-in. So the arm of that was called Bataka T. Tambiri, natives, we heal ourselves. Now we have about 30,000 members. This is, uh, this is a little insurance group here, Bataka T. Tambiri group. And, um, we did a study not long ago, published study um, where of uh, 
insured versus non-insured reduced the uh, uh, under age five mortality rate by 36% for total cost of the insurance is $4 per person per year with a small copay. And because they're, they're relieved of the fear of economic de devastation, they come to our hospital earlier. So the cost of care has dropped dramatically. Uh, we're not seeing the disasters of people waiting in late, late in the course of the illness before they would come into our institution. Um, one of the definitions of poverty is lack of options. Obviously, without an education, options are very limited. This is a school we found when we first arrived. Now we put up three schools and we have a little less than a thousand kids in school. And um, at every school, there's a, there's a garden and where the kids learn that some agricultural techniques, but also every kid gets a warm meal because we found the kids uh, that were hungry couldn't learn. And how many Batois pygmies can you fit into um, uh, a Land Rover uh, to take them to school? And the answer was 53. Uh, but not all of them are belted, so I'm sure CHP would have problems with that. Again, if there's anybody listening to this who is not a doc and you're wondering how you can engage, whatever skill set you had, have or needed in Sub-Saharan Africa, we had an artist come over and we're wondering what to do with her and my wife liked maps, she liked maps and the idea was to paint a map of the world on the back of one of the classrooms. So. We had a woman, um, she outlined all the countries in twig charcoal and picked some of the ladies who seemed to have an aptitude for, for painting. And one lady was up on a ladder uh, painting the upper right-hand corner of the map, uh, breastfeeding her kid at the time. And she finished that, got down off the ladder, dragged it all over to the left-hand side, climbed up and then asked my wife, what color? And my wife said, same color. So she got down off the ladder, went to the back of this classroom where there are like 30 or 40 Batwa all watching the map unfold. It's kind of the only act in town. And um, they talk, talk, talk. And then she came forward and she said, is that the same country? Same color, same country. And my wife said, yeah, yeah, Russia, same country. One woman went back to the back of the room and then all of a sudden the room became electric and these 30, 40 Batwa just flowed forward grabbed my wife and this artist lady Phyllis and said, do you mean that the world is round like a pumpkin and a mosey? Oh, I said, yeah, the world's round. And oh, if the world's round, what's on the inside? What's on the outside? Teach us. And that was a, uh, that was a genesis of our adult education program. So the kids go to school during the day until mid afternoon. Then the people come from the fields and all, and they will come in the adult study in the afternoon. Healthcare delivery education is difficult. Uh, there's not much in our area. Um, and, you know, statistics are in Uganda, four docs per population of 100,000. Um, you know, when I first came, you know, I was only doc for a quarter million. So most of the docs are centered in the urban areas. That's the same in the United States. And, you know, what do you do about that? And the same for nursing care. There are very few nurses in Uganda. And nurses really rock. Um, they they really run the healthcare system in Uganda. Doctors are mainly consultants. So now we have a nursing school. About five or six years ago, we built this nursing school. Now we have about 400 nursing students. Um, in the next few years, it's going to kind of morph into a, a full science and technology university. This is my friend Jean Creasy, a local dentist in our town. She was head of our foundation for several years. She brought over her friend Sadie Valentine, who's on her way to dental school. Sadie's <coughs> father is Doug Valentine. He's an oral surgeon, and she's teaching dental health to the nursing students in our one of our teaching classrooms. Just an example of um, the value of education is Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia is about to a pygmy. We got to know Sylvia when she was living in a grass hut. It was maybe six feet long, four feet wide, maybe five feet high. She and her sister and mother are living in that little grass hut. And she said she wanted Ninyenda Cuego Mishimero. I want to study in school. And we believed her. So we put her in school and she flourished. She was one of the first pygmy girls to ever go to university. I mean, ever to go to high school. Midway through high school, she met a guy. One thing led to another. She had a kid. That's a kid. Um, and But her husband was married. So... He dumped her, she ran away. We finally tracked her down, brought her back, got her mother to raise the kid. 
She went back to high school, finished high school. She went on to university and she graduated from university. Now she comes and works with our Batwa Development Program, heads up the education department. She's iconic. Two years ago, she was in New York, though. And that's a big transition for somebody who lived in a grass hut in the middle of the forest. And she came to New York, and my son works in New York. So he took her around elevators and escalators and pizzas and just having a good time. And he took her home on top of the Empire State Building. And on the way up, the elevator operator would ask questions, you know, where are you from and what are you doing in our fair city of New York? And he asked my son and he said, well, I live in Brooklyn. I'm a lawyer in Manhattan. Okay. He asked my daughter-in-law. She says, well, I teach it. I'm a professor at Cornell. Oh, okay. He asked Sylvia, where are you from? She said, I'm, I'm a Batwa from Uganda. And what are you doing in our fair city? She said, I've been invited to the United Nations to speak on indigenous rights. And she knocked it out of the park. She did great. She came back and she spoke to the Ugandan parliament about uh, rights of the Batwa pygmies. And last year she graduated now from with a master's in business administration. When my wife and I first came to Uganda, they said, you're the voice of the voiceless because the Batwa yeah, never spoke for themselves. So Sylvia not only has found her own voice, she's a powerful spokesman for the Batwa. If you consider coming, uh, when I heard actually this morning, Uganda is beginning to open up from COVID, but if you come, um, uh, you can, you know, these, we have volunteers are welcome. The reason you're needed, I, you know, 90% of the research dollars are spent on health problems. You know, we're talking about diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, chronic illness, whereas what we deal with is mainly infectious disease. 50% of the world's population do not have access to health care. You can change that. When you come, this is a traditional way Americans uh, view the world. We would like you to change um, the way you look at the world. Um, you know, this is um, obviously we have medical students that come over that say, you know, I've only got two weeks in Sub-Saharan Africa and I know it's a basket case. When I leave, I want to think things different. What can I do to change Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, probably not going to change the world in two weeks. But there's an adage that is local Westerners wear watches, but Africans have the time. And the reason that is important is that we are very goal oriented. Uh, whereas Africans are very relationship oriented. When you come, they'll ask questions, but they rarely will you be asked, what do you do? Uh, which is usually the conversation starter here. They'll say, tell me about your family. Tell me about your relationships. Tell me where you live. Because um, they want to know more who you are than, than what you do. I mean, a lot of times in medicine, we get all tied up in, in what we do, but they want to know who you are. There's an indigenous expression called Agari Hamai Nigo Agata Gufa. It takes all the teeth to break the bone. Um, another translation of that is united we stand. All these projects have been done in southwestern Uganda at the Bwindi, have been collaborative efforts with a variety, of, a lot of people. We work closely with, uh, we work with University of San Francisco, University of Nevada, Reno. We work with Tulane Medical School, University of um, UCSF. Um, um, and we've worked with some students at UC Davis. And so it's been a collaborative effort. And out of that collaborative effort, I think some, some amazing things have been done. So I would ask any members of the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society to come on over and engage. Um, I've been there for, I lived there for almost 15 years, uh, my wife and I, and I can honestly say it was the best time of my life. So come over and enjoy the, the good times. Makama Simwe, God bless uh, Waverly Mononga. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for questions, right? And somebody's going to help me with this? Yeah, so let me, sorry, let me turn off my sound here. Okay. So I know we have a couple of hands raised. <laughs> I don't know why I have an emergency alarm going off. Forgive me. Okay. So I know we had a couple of hands raised and um, Dr. Kellerman, if you want, you can stop sharing your screen and that way our um, faces will get a little bit, a little bit bigger. 
Oh, great. Thanks. I'm glad to be out of okay. that thing. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> All right. So I know we have a, um, I don't know if you can see the, the Q&A section down at the bottom, but I can also, um, I can also yeah, read it. Um, but Dr. Meyer has asked if oh, you can mention bike uh, for women and other um, enterprises that you do for women. Wait, what do we do for women? You have that down there? Yeah. Oh, bike for women, you're kidding me. George, oh, man, you, man, you threw me a meatball, thanks. Uh, I thought you were going to ask about novel treatments of HIV or something, so thanks. Um, yeah, we have a bike project where 1,500 bikes have been um, donated to women so they could develop an industry of selling, um, not only selling, but renting bikes to the rich tourists. We live where the mountain gorillas are. In the tourist lodges, you know, typical accommodations are 500, even a thousand dollars a night for a night. So we have this women's bike project on a piece of land that we own right next to the park, where the guests can come and rent bikes and they sell bikes. Uh, it's a steep part of the learning curve because the women had uh, never ridden a bike before, never worked on a bike before, and never run a business and never worked together. So we had some volunteers that have come over and taught them about accounting. And um, we got a little emergency room and it got filled up with some of the ladies because I taught them how to ride on the flats and they thought that that wasn't as much fun as trying to take to the hills. And um, they really couldn't understand the braking system. So these mountain bikes, you know, they got launched off the mountain bikes, but it's doing very, very well. And they've expanded the operation now. They're hiring quite a few ladies and, and it's doing, um, it's, they're doing a very good job of it. And it's been run independently, very little support from the West. Uh, they, when they sell out their inventory, they take a portion of, of their sales and, and to send over another container comes from Chicago where they have um, uh, renovated bikes, used bikes that come over and, you know, and they pay only the cost of the container. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, George. And you're welcome to come back and make sure you bring Lynn. She's a class act. I uh, can't hear you. Somebody, oh, you're muted, Sam. Here we go. Okay, wonderful. So we have another question. Um, someone wanted to know what kind of relationship you have with the World Health Organization. Well, we're kind of small fry. Um, uh, when Ebola was there, they were, you know, boy, they were there. Um, when they're refugees, they're there. Um, you know, they're a huge presence. I mean, how can you battle both COVID and, and Ebola in a country that is, you know, resource poor, the Congo? Um, CDC is a major presence uh, for us. We probably have access to them more, um, you know, particularly during the Ebola outbreak. If we had a hemorrhagic fever, we'd isolate them and we got cell phone coverage. Cell phone coverage in Sub-Saharan Africa is great, much better than where I'm living now in Nevada City. Um, you know, there's no gaps. You can buy a modem, small modem, plug it in your computer. It costs like 20 bucks a month for it. And you can do emails when you're on a bus. Um, it's just incredible. So we get a hemorrhagic fever and, and we make a call to CDC, which is based in this place called Entebbe, Uganda. And, and they're down in a flash. And usually down, and they, they give you a card for the, the, the consultant. And he's usually got, you know, a dozen different initials after his name. So they're the best and the brightest. But, you know, and this is editorial, if I have a chance, is, you know, these diseases don't know borders. They don't know borders of countries and they know borders of continents. So how do you not address diseases if we're not doing it collaboratively? Um, COVID-19 was just, oh, we got another virus in Uganda. You know, it was Ebola before. We got to wear a face mask. Yes, oh, aerosol transmission, I get it. So, all right, uh, face mask and everybody's done it. Um, social distancing, a little harder in Sub-Saharan Africa, but they kind of get it. So um, from, you know, we wouldn't have never done this project in Sub-Saharan Africa, wasn't working with the witch doctors. And if I can work with witch doctors, how come we can't work as Americans? You know, we speak the same language. I didn't even, you know, I, I learned their language, but, you know, if I can work across that cultural divide, it seems like that 
we ought to be able to reach across the aisle a little better than we're doing. So it's a little more painful. So yes, we work with the WHO and they're wonderful. And we work with CDC and they're great. Wonderful. Um, so our next question is, um, they wanted to know if you can talk about the AIDS pandemic in Uganda and its impact on the country's population, demographics, um, age, all of those. AIDS? HIV yes. AIDS? Uh, yeah, the AIDS pandemic, yes. Yeah. It was interesting because um, Uganda's poor. It's not like Botswana had diamonds. And so when AIDS hit, they said, you know, again, collaborative, they say, how do we work together? Um, so they got the Catholics, they got the churches, they got the government, and they got the locals. And when I went to Uganda, I went to the most remote villages where they'd never seen a Mzungu. Mzungu's a white guy. They'd never seen a Mzungu before. And I would ask by Surumu, which is a word for AIDS, I would ask about, and they knew about AIDS. Everybody knew about it. Didn't have access to condoms. And Uganda was a protectorate, not a colony. So kind of the Westerners couldn't come in, buy big chunks of land and kick the Africans off and bring others in to do their bidding. And so relationships with the Mzungus, white people was impeccable. The culture was still intact. And the upshot was that everybody got together and they said, we don't have the money to deal with it from any retroviral perspective, with testing perspective. When I first came, there were no tests available. There were no treatments. And, um, but we know how it's transmitted, we can deal with that. And so what they did was no grazing, <laughs> no grazing. Uh, they said, um, don't go to the bars and drink too much and have a one night stand. They said, ah, you can have a sweetie on the side, but make sure she's okay. Um, and, but just don't be promiscuous. And that was a message, no grazing. And the HIV rates went from antenatal clinics um, in the capital from some 20 to 30% of all antenatal visits were HIV positive down to less than 10%, simply because of that. Then they got condoms and then they got antiretrovirals. Um, uh, parenthetically, 60% of the cases we diagnose are discordant. Um, you know, the male will have it and the female won't. You know, the, it's hard to transmit. You know, if you're in a hospital and, and, you know, and you've drawn some blood and you pick up a needle and, oh, golly, I just poked myself with a hollow bore needle. The chance of transmitting HIV is one in 300. I mean, you should take post-exposure prophylaxis, but if they're hepatitis B and E antigen positive, um, the transmission rate is six to 30%. Um, so, and then, you know, sexually it's for a male from chance encounters, one in a little over a thousand, and for one a little over 2000, for females one in a thousand. But so Uganda's brought it down in our area from around 20% to 5.7%. Um, and it's just because of education and, and collaboration. It's worked quite well. So, got some more questions? Oh, maybe I can look it up. I think that looks, looks, looks like about the end of the questions. Uh, said you ought to <laughs> Oh, thanks. Somebody said it was a good presentation. Now, thank you. I, yeah, okay, we'll wrap it up, but you're welcome to come over. Um, I'll, uh, Sam and, and Bob, I'll give you the contact information if you want to come. We have a foundation here in, in the United States, actually ended up getting named after me, that will arrange all your travel. We have guest houses over there that are run by a couple um, from actually our local area, Grass Valley area, and they have three kids. We have guest houses. Uh, usually we suggest if you're coming over that you stay longer. If you can give us a month, that would be great. And give us a year it's even better that way you can learn the language and customs a little bit and the one requirement well it's two requirements number one is you engage if you can't dance that's okay but you're asked to try um, so engage we have medical meetings every morning of the hospital staff you engage and then the second thing is you have to teach you have to leave a legacy we have a nursing school and you know and and we had george teach over there and so those are the two things so 
come and 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 you know share the joy. It's a wonderful place to be. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. But, and this um, presentation is being recorded. So we will get that um, and we'll post that um, probably on the museum page um, on our website so that everybody can uh, have access to that. Um, I will also email it to all the registered attendees. Um, so you have that link if you'd like to share it as well. Is there any questions other than that? We'll, we'll let like you all go. Person. I'd like to personally thank you, Dr. Kellerman. Thanks, Bob. Obra Paz Cross, if not in Sacramento, maybe at the Buindi. Very good. Very good. Thanks. All the best.